Okay, well, welcome everyone. We are delighted to see many people here in person and we'd also like to welcome our Zoom audience. Um, we welcome you here on behalf of the Promise Armenian Institute and the Armenian Studies Center within the Promise Armenian Institute. My name is Professor Ann Kargosian. I'm the director of the Promise Armenian Institute and it's my privilege to welcome you to this Distinguished Lecture, The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century to pre be presented by our dear friend and colleague, Professor Bedras Der Matosian of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We're delighted to welcome him to UCLA to share with us information on this subject, the title of his recent book published by Stanford University Press, uh, because Professor uh, Dermot, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I will ignore what's going on on the screen. Um, so Professor Dermatosian is one of the foremost scholars worldwide on the subject of the Adana massacres, which, as most of you are aware, um, were a part of the escalating violence in the run-up to the Armenian genocide of the early 20th century. So at this time of year in April, as our Promise Armenian Institute uh, honors the memory of our ancestors that were slain during the genocide and also the survivors of the genocide, it is particularly fitting for us to hear about this very relevant period in Armenian and Ottoman history. Um, and we are very grateful to Professor Dermatosian for coming all the way here to Los Angeles to bring this important subject to our audience. Let me mention that this Promise Armenian Institute um, lecture is co-sponsored by the UCLA Richard Hovhannisian Chair of Modern Armenian History, the Promise Institute for Human Rights here at the UCLA School of Law, the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, uh, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser, the Ararat Eskijin Museum as well. And on behalf of our Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Let me also mention that at the end of the lecture, there will be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions of Dr. Dermatosian here in the room, as well as those of you who are watching live on Zoom. If you're watching on Zoom, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your questions. So at this point, it now gives me great pleasure to turn the event over to its organizer, Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA's Department of History. As most of you are aware, Professor, Hovhannis, uh, Professor Aslanian is the holder of the Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History and has been such since 2012. He is also the inaugural director of our P Armenian Studies Center within the Promise Armenian Institute. Professor Aslanian is a distinguished scholar in modern and early modern Armenian history and has recently completed his second book manuscript, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora 1512 to 1800, which is expected to appear through Yale University Press very soon. So Sabu, I will now turn this event over to you. Thank you so much, Anne, for that wonderful introduction to the event. Thank you all for being here. I pretty, I'm particularly delighted to see some old faces that I've known and some new ones, and especially uh, young scholars and students. So uh, I join my colleague, Dr. Anne Karagosian, in welcoming you to this important event hosted by our institute. I will provide first a brief introduction to our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Bedros Dermatosian, followed by some remarks on the importance of his recent book, The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century. 
We are truly honored and thankful to have Dr. Dermatosian join us today to make this event possible, and of course, all of you as well. Uh, and I sh I'm also grateful to all the people who co-sponsored this event. Uh, and so after my brief introduction, uh, Bedros will deliver his talk for roughly 45 to 50, 55 minutes, following which we will have ample time and opportunity to pose questions to our speaker and those of you on, on Zoom, I should say, uh, uh, at the risk of re uh, repetition, please write down your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will host as many of them. We will place as many of them to our uh, lecture as possible. So Dr. Ber Dr. Bedros, De Bedros Dermatosian is professor of modern Middle East history at the Department of History at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Born and raised in Jerusalem, he is a graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he began his graduate studies in the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. He completed his PhD in Middle East history in the Department of Middle Eastern South Asian African Studies at Columbia University in 2008. From 2008 to 2010, he was a lecturer of Middle East history in the Faculty of History at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. His areas of interest include ethnic politics in the Middle East, inter-ethnic violence in the Ottoman Empire, Palestinian history, and the history of the Armenian Genocide. Formerly a president of the Society for Armenian Studies, Dr. Dermatosian is the author of numerous edited volumes, um, as well as two trailblazing research monographs uh, respectively speaking, Shattered Dreams of Revolution, From Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire. That's the first book, Stanford University Press, uh, 2014. And most recently, his monograph, The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and, uh, and Violence in the Early 20th Century, that came out through uh, Stanford just uh, a couple of years, a year ago. Uh, so his most recent publication is an edited volume Denial of Genocides in the 21st Century, where many of the leading authorities in the world on denialism have their contributions. He serves on the board of directors of multiple international and, and educational institutions, uh, as well as on many journal boards, the most prominent of which is the flagship journal of the field, International Journal of Middle East Studies, otherwise known to many of us as IJMES. Dr. Dermatosian is also the series editor uh, of a series titled Armenians in, in, in the Modern and Early Modern World, published by I.B. Torres, uh, form, form, uh, uh, formerly I.B. Torres, now part of Bloomsbury. Let me now say a few words to provide some backdrop and hopefully to enrich our appreciation of the Adana book about which Bedros will be speaking on at length. So, I'll begin by um, referring very quickly to uh, a very important article that appeared a more than 100 years ago during the middle of the First World War by the French, celebrated French historian Marc Bloch, who wrote, a, who wrote on how false news and rumors only propagate themselves in societies where, quote, they find the favorable cultural broth, unquote. Once they begin to spread, according to Bloch, rumors and false news become toxic vessels through which people, quote, unconsciously express all their prejudices, hatreds, fears, and all their emotions, unquote. Unchecked by other forces, the circulation of fake news can lead to political violence that threatens the foundations of any given society, a fate of which all of us here are all too familiar in our own country. Dermatosian's uh, The Horrors of Adana provides the first lucid and archivally grounded account of the Adana massacres of 1909, when close to 20,000 Armenians were killed in the Ottoman province of Adana on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Relying on a dazzling array of primary sources in a dozen languages, Dermatosian's book sheds light, new light on how Ottoman society during the early years of the Young Turk Revolution provided the ideal cultural broth, to use the phrase by Mark Bloch, not only for the spread of rumors and false news regarding the region's native Armenian population, but also for the perpetration 
for the perpetration of one of the 20th century's most violent episodes. In eight clearly written chapters, their Matosian makes a compelling argument about how the development of, the, of an Ottoman public sphere, shored up by the growth of newspapers and supported by the, by the telegraph and trains, helped transform deep-seated economic and religious resentment against the Armenians into a perfect storm of massacre and ethnic cleansing. Despite claiming many lives uh, of citizens and forever altering the trajectory of this once economically vibrant corner of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Adara massacres have been relegated to the margins of Middle Eastern world history, being transformed in effect into a non-event. Focusing his rich analytical narrative on the core concepts of the public sphere and post-revolutionary fervor, Adana's integration into the world system of global trade, and especially on the spread of rumors and false news regarding an Armenian conspiracy to massacre the region's Muslim population, Der Matosian provides a pioneering study of a little known episode of ethnic cleansing and mass violence. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Der Matosian. Thank you very much for everyone coming. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Raslanian for organizing and inviting me. I'd like to thank the Promise Institute and other co-sponsors uh, co of this event. Uh, and I'm humbled by your presentation, introduction, actually, Professor Raslanian, thank you very much. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss briefly the book on the horrors of Adana, which was published in 2000. 22 by Stanford University Press. Of course, whatever I'm going to discuss here does not reflect the in-depth uh, contribution of this book. So I'll be brief, 45 minutes, trying to provide the basic, the main arguments that I try to make in the book. I'm also honored that my daughter is here today, Kanard Dermatosian, with us. And she has to leave soon because I don't think that the topic is uh, for her age. So this is the cover of the book, and there was a lot of discussion as to what should be the cover of the book. Uh, I suggested uh, victims from the genocide, but the press that that would be unethical to put victims of, of the, sorry, victims of the massacres. And so we sticked up to this image, which dis dis displays the destruction that took place as a result of the massacres. Now, why did I write the book, this book? What were the reasons of writing this book? And writing took me, research took me about eight to nine years, going to different archives, different languages. And it was a lengthy and painful project, I should say, because if you do the same thing and do the, the research the same topic over and over, dealing with pain and suffering and massacres, it has a toll on the author too. Uh, the fate of the other massacres do not appear in Middle Eastern studies nor in Ottoman studies. Open any book, major books about the Middle Eastern studies and other and uh, Ottoman studies, you'll not find it there. Second, even within Armenian historiography, there is little attention because the Armenian genocide covers the major as the lion's share of discussing the Armenian pain and suffering of massacres in the course of history. Let alone the Hamidian massacre, which we don't have a single monograph today that deals with the Hamidian massacres. We have a bunch of articles here and there and an edited volume, 
uh, in uh, edited journal volume in Paris by the by uh, Boris Ajemian. And third, I, I wanted to make a contribution to the field of massacre st studies, which is a new field now growing up in order to ask questions because not all massacres are genocides. Genocides might have multiple massacres, but not all massacres are genocides. And I wanted also to try to understand as what happened in Adana from an interdisciplinary perspective, because massacres are such huge events, such complex events, that it is impossible to understand it only from the perspective of history. We need this interdisciplinary approach through analyzing it through disciplines of political science, psychology, sociology, and so on. And I also wanted to go beyond essentialization that this is the Muslims who killed the Armenians and the Armenians who killed the Muslims. As a matter of fact, above 20,000 Armenians were killed during the massacre, Adana massacres, and about 2,000 Muslims were killed by different Armenians and other Christian groups. <clears throat> and this would be a sequel to my first book as part of the trilogy. The third book would be about the uh, about the Balkan Wars. There are four interrelated themes that I try to understand the Adana massacres, and these themes are extremely important. There are interdisciplinary themes. The first one is public sphere and subaltern public spheres. Second one are rumors, as Sebo alluded in his uh, presentation. Rumors play an important role in all types of massacres, not only in the Adana massacres. And third, emotions. Never underestimate the power of emotions in mobilizing and instigating violent violence against the targeted group. And fourth, also humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention are an extremely important concept to understand as to why there was never humanitarian intervention for the Armenians in the three phases of violence faced by the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire, the Hamidian massacre, the Adana massacre and the Armenian genocide. By public sphere, public spheres actually provide an important medium for the enactment of social identities and can be seen as a medium that precipitates ethno-religious tensions between dominant and non-dominant groups and tensions that may manifest as violence, including massacres. And rumors can be defined as unverified account or explanation of events circulating from one person to person and pertaining to an object, event, or issues of public concern. Rumors can solidify ethno-religious ethno boundaries of the crowd, giving them a sense of bonding together and affirming their authenticity while preparing them for an imminent violent onslaught on the other group. Emotions are powerful social and political forces that can be harnessed and shaped in the service of collective action. In the context of political upheavals, emotions often motivate people toward violent action by creating an us versus them mentality. And humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention are extremely important actions that never happened in the case of Armenians. In the 19th century, humanitarian intervention is represented according to Davide Rodokno, who wrote an excellent book, a coercive, diplomatic, or armed reaction against massacre undertaken by a state or a group of states inside the territory of a targeted state. Its main motivation is to end massacre, atrocity, and extermination, or to prevent repetition of such events. It is an ex post facto. It's important to understand this ex post facto, meaning happens after the massacres, whose objective is to protect civilian populations mistreated and unprotected by the targeted state, government, agents, or authorities. Many ask as to why there weren't humanitarian interventions in the case of Armenians, war there, is, there is no humanitarian intervention today as the lodging corridor is closed. This is the map of Adana, just to have an idea. It's an Ottoman province on the Southern section of the Mediterranean Sea. Its location is very strategic on the sea. And uh, this is the map of Adana divided into four sub provinces, the Sanjak of Selifke, Sanjak of Mersin, Sanjak of Adana, 
Sanjak of Khuzan, and here you have the Sanjak of Yarfuz. Jabal Barakat is an important city, but Adana is the capital. So Adana is the province, and the capital of Adana is Adana itself, the city where the violence began and escalated and precipitated to different parts of the province of Adana, including the, <clears throat> including the province of Aleppo. So the massacre started in Adana, then poured into Aleppo, uh, into few cities, but then stopped there due to the efforts of the uh, governor, the valley of Adana, Rashid Pasha. But the region of Adana is also an important portion of the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia between 18 and 1198 to 1375. It's where the Cilician, Cilician Catholic state existed until the Armenian genocide, 1918 until 1920, because Khabayan goes and comes back after the defeat, 1918. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, uh, the life and biography of uh, Khabayan, Sahar Khabayan II, Catholic was an interesting story in itself, but it is important to understand the importance, the historical connection that Cilicia had has towards Armenians. Of course, Cilicia is not considered part of historic Armenia. It's due to the Arab invasion, in the, uh, in the period that Armenians came to the southern section of the, of the region and established here a kingdom that lasted until 30, 1375 and played a dominant role, an important role during the crusade period. And then after that, it collapsed. I argue in the book that there are both long-term causes and short-term causes for the massacres. The long-term causes can be defined in, the, in terms of administrative reforms in the 19th century, followed by sedentarization and pacification of the tribes in the region, followed by influx of refugees resulting in competition over resources, and fourth, changing in the land codes in the Ottoman Empire, and finally, economic development. The most important, I would argue, is the economic development, which is mainly deals with cotton and other land. Cotton was considered as, was called, as the white gold, but in different languages also it's called uh, white gold. We're discussing in my graduate seminar, Ben Becker's book about the cotton and gold history, and to that extent it plays an important role. That the importance of Adana in cotton production rises as a result of the civil war that took place in the United States in 1861, where the decline, sharp decline took place in the South, interruption took place in the South, and eventually afterwards, you have now the rise of markets, specifically in Egypt and Adana, in producing cotton. We have, we have sources, primary sources, that say in the beginning of the 1861, after 1861, the Ottoman government starts encouraging the plantation and cultivation of cotton in the region by providing seeds, American seeds, because there are different types of cottons. There is American, there is Egyptian. Today, if you buy something, it says uh, Egyptian cotton. There is American cotton. There are multiple types of cotton. But cotton played an important role in Adana towards the end of the 19th century. Cotton also played an important role in providing economic opportunities to the poor. So on a yearly basis, migrant workers would come to Adana from the surrounding regions to work in tilling and in cultivating. Tilling of cotton is going to happen, takes place actually in April, and cultivation takes place in the fall, so twice a year. Around 120,000 migrant workers come from the region, around Adana provinces. If 100,000 came, about 40 to 50,000 of those were Armenians, and they work in the fields, and they were able to make sufficient money to support their families for the rest of the year. Remember this. But, and it was a major venture that families were involved in, 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 in spinning the cotton in their houses. As a matter of fact, Armenian houses, they had multiple bales under the, in the underground of their houses of cotton, which actually accelerated the burning of houses during the massacres. But towards the end of the 19th century, 
as a result of the development of the, of the tilling and farming and harvesting due to the introduction of new implements, machines, that's working on steam engines. Now it leads modernization of cotton, leads to decline of the need of manpower and eventually creating a grudge, specifically among the Muslim workers who come every year to work in Adam. So basically now the tilling machines, which were owned by Armenians, by the way, Armenians were the ones who imported these machines from Great Britain, United States, the machine would do the work of 20 migrant workers, and hence creating an economic envy and anger towards the Armenians, which will manifest itself also as one of the factors leading to the massacres. As a matter of fact, during the massacres, most of these machines were destroyed by the mob. And this does not happen only in the in the, in the Adana case, but in different parts around the globe, in India and other places, where there's an attack against modernization of modernization of the tools, implements of, uh, of agriculture, because they feel the way in which the agriculture implements have destroyed their livelihood. Going back to the short causes, these causes are the Yachter Revolution of 1908, followed by the emergence of resilient public sphere after the revolution. And third, the counter-revolution of April 13, 1909. Revolution is an important event in the history of the Ottoman Empire. And as a matter of fact, I presented here many years ago, but my first book, Shattered Dreams of Revolution, which aimed to understand the way in which the revolution impacted the Armenians, created a public sphere, where everyone thought that they were going to live now in brotherhood, in liberty, fraternity, and equality, and they were going to be equal citizens, but that dream shattered, as a matter of fact, because of the incongruities and conflicts of ideology or, or viewing the future between the dominant and the non-dominant groups. Now, what I'm going to do now is to discuss the period before the other massacres before the 1908 revolution. Of course, we tend to discuss massacres as an event, but there are agents, important agents, human agents that give also move history around the globe. And usually massacres are called massacres, but there are events. And in the case of Adana, there are important figures who play an important role in the history of Adana. One of them is Mushek Seropia. He was the Armenian bishop who was appointed as the prelate of Adana. And Mushek was turned out to be a Hunchak activist, revolutionary who left the party and he became a priest. He, he was a priest and a member of the party and eventually became a bishop in Adana. And Mushek was under surveillance constantly by the Ottoman government for his supposedly revolutionary activities in Adana. But prior to the Adana massacres, Mushek was in very good terms with Bahri Pasha, the governor of Adana. Actually, they put hand in hand together and eventually they, they built this, which is the Armenian market, which is called, in other words, it's the Bahri Pasha market, Bahri Pasha Charshesu, which is an Armenian market. Armenian school year market, which was built by, uh, by the, uh, which was built by the uh, Armenians and with the support of the governor. So unlike the other provinces, the situation in Adana is much better during the Hamidian period. And Adana was not touched by the Hamidian massacres due to the valley, due to the governor and due to the cordial relationship between the Armenians and the others. But despite this, there were a lot of tensions within Adana. And these tensions were represented by notables, <clears throat> Armenian leadership, and the governor. And one of the most prominent figures that played a role in Adana was this person. His name is Abdul Qadir Baghdadi Zadeh, the most powerful notable in Adana, who was anti-governor, who was against the governor 
owned large tracts of land and eventually would play an important role during the massacres by instigating the, uh, the mobs against Armenians. This the image I found, I found this image few last year, I think. I couldn't find an image of the Abdel Qadir Babaza. This is the only image that I have is smoking a cigarette. Another important figure is Garabit Gökterelian. And Garabit Gökterelian is a, is a, was a lawyer, large landowner, and was, the, uh, was a member of the Court of Appeal in Adana. And so eventually, prior to the uh, 1908 revolution, there are rumors spreading in Adana that the revolutionary activities are taking place. Of course, they are taking place uh, because of the geostrategic position of Adana and the center of the Armenian revolutionary activities, mostly Hinchak. The Dashnaks are not in Adana or in Silesia. The strength of the Hinchaks are in, uh, the uh, Hinchaks are very strong in the region of Silesia. And they would use Cyprus, specifically after 1880s, when Cyprus become under the British control, use Cyprus as a way to go to Adana and uh, bring uh, contraband articles such as uh, newspapers, books, uh, revolutionary books, and guns or many other. Uh, so it was the revolutionary activities, minor revolutionary activities, I would say, not major revolutionary activities, but rumors started spreading. And the rumor said that the Armenians in Adana are going to revolt in order establish what? The Silesian people. And this is an important thesis, quote unquote, that would play an important role in during the, uh, prior to the uh, uh, Adana massacres. So 1908 revolution take place, takes place in Adana as in other regions, Armenians and Turks and other ethnicities hug each other. There are major events taking place during the uh, second constitution period, which is the 1900 revolution. There are uh, poetries are written, odes, they go to villages, they visit the cemeteries uh, and honor those who fallen for the cause, uh, who fighting against the Sultan Abdel Hamid II. And, but this is the time for Armenians also to start breathing. And they start practicing what any other democratic regime should practice, which is freedom, of speech, liberty. But here Armenians are thinking, as one author said, that they are in the middle of Paris. But they start practicing their cultural nationalism. They start publishing. They have pictures, images of the Silesian kingdom, banners. And there are public processions of Mushir Bishop. And as a matter of fact, he would be accused of dress like a king. All right? That's not the king dress, that's a dress, the vest of Musher, which is the basic vest of any, you know, any uh, for uh, major uh, uh, church events. But also it was the time for drama and theatrical presentations. And one theatrical presentation is about Tamerlane and the fall of Sivas, which take place, which took place in, in Mercy, the coastal city. And Apparently, it's about the theatrical presentation, it's a historical presentation, whereby the Silesian king, king is in chains and Tamerlane comes and eventually, it, it, apparently, to, uh, an angel appears to the king saying that you will soon be relieved from these shackles and you will soon reclaim your kingdom. And everyone towards the end shouts, Long live Armenia, long live Armenia in the presence of Turkish officials. Now, I thought hard about this, uh, about these the theatrical presentations. Many years after my research, I was in Nasser, actually looking at book. And then I was skimming in a, in a book of theatrical presentations by Bedros Surya. And I found the theatrical presentation. It was written by Bedros Surya in the 1880s. Bedra Sulan is in Bolis, it's in Istanbul, it's not, he is not in Adana. And then go forward to that finding. After five years of finding the theatrical presentation, I found the unwritten, the unpublished 
memoirs of Musher, 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 Bishop Musher, in which he said that we had to tone down Pedro Asturian's presentation in order to have, in order to not harm the sensitivities of the Turkish, uh, our Turkish brothers. Similar theatrical presentation takes place in uh, Tarsus by in the American College by Armenian students with Hamlet, etc. So that also leads to major tension. But this was also the time of buying arms, selling and buy, buying arms. Muslims were buying arms, Armenians were buying arms, everyone was buying arms. From the Armenian perspective, we have to be very careful. It's a fragile period now, whereby Abdel Hamid can come back because the regime still has not gone, despite the fact that we have a constitution, we have a new beginning, which is the 1908 revolution, but the regime is not gone. And who are the regime now? It's Abdul Qadir, that guy, the notable, and his clique against the Young Turks. And so you have now the emergence of new Young Turk leader by the name of Ihsan Fikri here, and Ismail Sefa, and many others, but the leader is Ismail Fikri, who appoints himself as a Young Turk and writes to the center in Salonika saying, I'm, I, I have established here a uh, uh, cell the club for the young Turks, and they start cooperating with Armenians, so everything goes well. His arch enemy is the Vali, the governor of Adana, because he was conservative and was functioning, well, was working against the, uh, against the, uh, uh, he was working against the young Turks and against, against freedom. So to make a long story short, in Adana, the tensions are very high after the young Turk revolution. There are a lot of tensions, and Armenians are in the middle of these, uh, these tensions. But in April, but April 11, an Armenian is attacked by three Muslims, an Armenian by the name of Ovanes, and he is in retaliation. He kills two Muslims, and the funeral of that Muslim, Muslim becomes a source of mobilization. Emotions are very high now. And everyone now start thinking that the Armenians are planning something big. They're planning to do what? To erect the Cilician Kingdom through revolting and triggering humanitarian intervention by the European powers in order to establish the new Lebanon. They were aware that Lebanon got an autonomy in 1860, and that was the plan, supposedly. Now, I've done extensive research in the Dashnak archives, these documents no one has seen. And I tried to look, maybe that's the case. Maybe the Armenians were planning something, but I didn't find anything. I found that Armenians are lamenting about the situation in Adana, that we don't see anything that has been promised to us in terms of liberty. Nothing is happening. And we have to do the only thing, one thing. We have to arm ourselves for self-defense. And self-defense is not an offensive act, it's a defensive act. They were lamenting that we don't have, we don't have enough, enough uh, weapons. But this is part of the mentality going on, buying weapons, selling weapons, et cetera. So there's a, it's a boiling situation now. When that funeral takes place, there is mobilization, and that single event becomes the representation that it's a larger event, it's a larger project of Armenians now revolting in order to establish the Kingdom of Adana. Tuesday, April 13, is a market day whereby all these migrant workers come. And that day, you see irregular Ottoman irregular soldiers they call Bashibozuks and other gang members, etc. Now they are in the Armenian neighborhood. Armenians seeing this, they close their shop. Now the other Muslims see Armenians close their shop, would think what? That Armenians are preparing something. They close their shop too. Eventually, uh, the massacre starts. The Vali, the governor of Adana, who is located in Adana itself, the capital city cannot do anything. 
he is inept. What he does, he sends a telegram to the center, to the government, saying that things are out of control here. We can't do anything. I can't do anything. He says, please send us soldiers. And the undersecretary of the Minister of Interior, Adil Bey, responds saying, make sure to take care to protect the Europeans and to bring peace and uh, serenity to others. Now, Armenians use this as the order for massacres because they say this is a euphemistic expression, which we're used to it during the Hamidian period. And protect the, the foreigners means kill the Armenians, but protect the foreigners. This is after the first wave of massacres, around 16 to 1800 Armenians are killed in the city and around 400 Muslims are killed too by Armenians because they attack the Armenian quarter. The city starts burning all the Armenian properties, but not yet the final blow. So eventually, supposedly Armenians hand in their weapons due, due to an agreement by the governor and other entities and agree that peace and serenity is now going to prevail and the massacres have ended. Now, what happens during the inter massacre period? The government, instead of putting a state of siege whereby no one can do anything, he just gives promises that things are going to be fine. And Sam Fikri, the CUP member, is also the editor of this important newspaper called Atidad, Moderation. And it is now in the aftermath of the first wave of massacre, he publishes this issue, which is issue number 33, April 20, 1909. And this is the beginning of the article, CIC, to the political section, with his uh, astonishing uprising. In it, he describes the intentions of the Armenians in a very methodical manner, the way in which they supposedly came from all the provinces, historically, and gathered in Adana, preparing themselves for the uprising, which would trigger humanitarian intervention and Armenians would have an autonomy. But he uses very violent language. And as certain Massacre scholars, for example, call it killing by words. Killing by words follow killing by force. And if the rumors were spreading around on verified accounts, now people start reading and saying, wow, these rumors are true because sometimes you read things and you start believing. Think of today, you know, rumors and, and social network. And this eventually would lead to the second wave of massacres, which took place between April 25 to April 27. But before the second wave of the massacres, the government sends three battalions from Rumeli, from the Western, Western area of the Ottoman Empire to control the situation in Adana. So the three battalions come to Adana and camp in the city and Supposedly, Armenians fire on the camp, triggering the second wave of the massacres. And the second of wave of massacres, soldiers participated, looting, and it was much more destructive than the first wave of massacres. There was a Mushevian Abkarian school, which housed the injured people from the first wave of massacre, housed refugees who came to Adana seeking refuge, and the whole building was ablazed with the people inside. <clears throat> these are just images of the destruction of uh, the city of Adana. Most of these houses are Armenian. And reasons that were destroyed because the whole city was put on, on, on fire by using gasoline. And since you have most of Armenians involved in the cotton business, housing in their, in their house, uh, putting in their houses leads to massive inflagration. 
thousands of Armenians are now become refugees within the city of Adana under the mercy of the international organizations. Now, it's important to understand that here there are there is nominal justice that what that was achieved in other and most Armenians are not going to discuss that. So what does the government do? First of all, the government sends two investigation commissions to really understand as to what happened in Adana. One of the investigation commissions was the government commission, represented by Faik Bey and House Tumostichan, Armenian and the, and the Turk. And the second one is the parliamentary parliamentary commission by the name of Hagob Babigyan and Mr. Kemal Bey. This is Hagob Babigyan. Babigyan was a famous lawyer, CUP member, Committee of Union Young Turk member, who comes to Adana to stay for a few days, to stay, no, to stay for a long period of time in order to investigate as to what happened to the Armenians. But he can't. He suddenly leaves Adana and goes back, criticizing the way in which the government is handling everything. And he writes a report, 80-page report. And three days before presenting the report in the parliament, he dies. Now, there's an interview with her daughter, with his daughter, sorry, Alice, in France. She says, I remember two members of the young Turks came to see my grandfather, my father, so that, that, my father, and they gave her, they gave him a cigarette, which was poison. And we don't know if this is true or not. If you know Sylvie Marianne, Sylvie Marianne is the granddaughter of Hago Pabidia great-granddaughter. So here you have a mystery. What happened to Hago Babidian? Where is the report? We don't have the report. Because the first Armenian report surfaces in 1990. Supposedly before dying, the patriarchate goes, makes a copy. So there's a whole mystery there that we don't know what's happening. But we know that he was, he died. They called him the Zola, Emil Zola of Armenians and the other massacre as the Dreyfus case for Armenians. Now, of course, of course, justice supposedly is going to take place. After the second wave of massacres, there are courts martialed, local courts are formed by the perpetrators themselves. What do they do? They put 120 Armenians into the prison, torture them, and take false statements that the Armenian, that really everyone really saying that Armenians, that we were planning an uprising to establish the kingdom of Cilicia. And we have multiple eyewitness accounts. Armenians protest in the capital of Istanbul, uh, capital in Bolis, Istanbul, Constantinople, and pressure the government that this is an unjust situation here. How do you perpetrators now are involved in justice? So based on that, the government sends two Court marshals under the presidency of Kenan Pasha, and the second one is Ismail Fazul Pasha. Kenan Pasha comes to Adana, establishes military tribunal, but instead of starting the investigation afresh, meaning from the beginning, he takes whatever has been done by the first court marshal and continues with that. And then in his final report says Armenians are to be blamed for the uprising. They were instigating, they were planning to establish the Kingdom of Cilicia. Now, meanwhile, Hagop Babigyan now returning back from Adana to, to, to the capital, and he starts giving interviews that Kenan Pasha's arguments are unbelievable. He's wrong in everything he's saying and aborts the decisions that were taken by this military tribunal, which also convicted six Armenians to capital punishment. He says, at least one or two of these Armenians were not responsible. They were during the massacres, they were hiding at least one in the German bank. Now, when Armenian protests this, the government says, sends another final investigation commission under the presidency of Ismail Fazil Pasha, who comes now and conducts a new investigation, 
And of course, courts martial are extremely problem because Armenians live in the surrounding villages. Of course, think of it. I'm just discussing the uh, massacres in the city of Adana. The massacres spread around the different Every single district is a, is a story of itself. It's a book of itself. That's why I argue in the book, this is not a definitive history. I don't believe that there is anything called definitive history. Types of crimes. These courts martials followed the penal, Ottoman penal code, according to the crimes that were committed. They, these were the major types of crimes, murder, extortion, rape, arson, and many other types. More than 30 Muslims received capital punishment and were hanged. Hung, hang, hang, hang. Some of them were innocent. Because it's easier to put the blame on someone who is not an important figure. Now, when the when the when Ismail when Kenan Pasha gives the uh, orders to hang the Armenians, Armenians start complaining that the real perpetrators are not put into justice, and the real perpetrators. Regardless, they're responsible, regardless whether they participated or not. Some of them did participate. And the real perpetrators were the governor, the notables, Abdul Qadir Baghdadi Zadeh, the sub governors of different districts, Isam Fikri, the editor of the newspaper. There were about six of them, who all six of them eventually received very light punishments from two weeks in prison to two years banishment. So that's why I say there is nominal justice that was achieved. Total 347 people were convicted in the case of the Adana massacres. About 30 of them were Armenians. The range, these, these are the range, range of uh, punishment received, 15 days in prison, temporary exile, imprisonment, total banishment, death sentences, etc. And these are the six Armenians on the gallows. The most famous of them is a person by the name of Misak. And uh, Misak was uh, a butcher, actually, by profession. And uh, he was hung. Last but not least, I put the book in the larger context of global history. Because nothing is unique about Adana. Every event has a certain uniqueness. But it's not a unique case too, because similar acts of violence take place in different parts of the, of the world. And I try to ask the question, why would ordinary men suddenly resort to violence, killing the Armenians? And these, this violence is not, does not happen overnight. It's an accumulated tension that existed in the region for a, uh, for a long period of time. Massacres are far more complex phenomenon than what we think of. We need, as I said, different tools in order to understand the psychology of those perpetrators, why did they kill, and how did they kill. I also devote the conclusion, concluding section discussing the Odessa massacres that took, took place against the Jews in 1905, and the Sikh massacres that took place in India in 1984, in order to show how structures of violence are similar, how rumors play an important role in all cases, how police is involved, how there is no justice. In the both cases, actually, justice was not achieved. At least in the case of Adana, you had nominal justice. But all these 300 people who were convicted, all of them were released eventually, you know, released by imperial pardoning, during the birthday of the, of the Sultan, or during World War I, everyone was released. <clears throat> the structure of violence and actors here, and even investigation commissions, until today, India has not achieved for the Sikh massacres justice. They had 10 commissions, and all of them failed to really uh, achieve justice. In the case of Odessa, the government, did not exonerate the Jews. They said that this is the blame 
the, the Jews should be blamed for the massacres, and at least in the Armenian case, the government issued an order for exoneration. Finally, last but not least, the Adana and the massacres and the Armenian genocide. I can answer that question during question and answer period. Thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for uh, questions. Um, I can help host some of the questions unless you want to do one of the questions yourself. No. Anyone? And thank you so much. Really uh, comprehensive talk and overview of your very fine book. I have a question about what you referred to in the beginning about the lack yeah. of. Everything okay? Yes. About the lack of um, humanitarian intervention uh, and and the, the stated that it didn't happen in the during the Hamidian massacres, but not in the massacres nor during the genocide. But I think that depends on the definition, right? It, it was defined by the gentleman you referred to as a diplomatic or armed reaction against the massacres undertaken by the state yes but near east relief and so forth there were missions missionaries and we even celebrated the curse a couple of weeks ago in the promise of Institute. so that could be defined i suppose as no no well maybe you could elaborate sure I, a very good question because i didn't have time to elaborate there's difference between humanitarianism humanitarian aid and humanitarian intervention in the 19th century humanitarian intervention meant physically interfering in that state in order to stop further massacres. It happened in the, in the case of Greece, in the case of Lebanon, and in the case of Crete. And usually, as David Rodokno says, humanitarian intervention takes place when all the European countries are on the same page that no one is going to benefit from humanitarian intervention. That's what prevented, supposedly, in the case of the Armenians. You have diplomatic maneuvers in the Hamidian period. You have diplomatic maneuvers in the, in the case of uh, Adana, where you have the, the major cruisers, Italian, American, British, French, German cruisers, are in the coastal city of, of Mersin and Ottoman Empire, supposedly, thinking that they're going to intervene in order to stop and they say no we shouldn't intervene because it would lead to work it would lead to the escalation of the violence but when you didn't intervene and it happens no so what what what's the mentality here so no one is going to benefit of course Armenian situation as everyone knows between Russia between European powers and Ottoman Empire supposedly it did not fit into their uh, interest to intervene on behalf of our Armenians. Physical intervention to stop the massacres. Humanitarian efforts did, did take place, but they also humanitarian efforts in the other massacres. Armenians were not that much happy, but European intervention, European humanitarianism, because there was this is the first time that you have Armenians are now able to talk about their activities. I mean, Zabeli Asayan goes and many, many others go to Adana in order to. Uh, alleviate the suffering of the Armenians, but they're also critical both of the Ottoman orphanage, which is opened by Jamal Pasha, and the missionary orphanages. They're afraid that now these orphans, because orphans are a major important issue during the Ottoman massacres, and their families are killed. There are thousands of orphans, Armenian orphans, and they, they're, feeling, they're feeling for Yazabad Yasai, for example, is that these orphanages would become factories of depleting Armenian identity, teaching them a new religion, kind of new denomination of religion, Catholicism or Protestantism, and you know, and eventually leading the, these kids to forget their own identity. And they're very critical of the Ottoman orphanage, the Adana orphanage established by Jamal Bush. Um, all right, uh, we're gonna go there first. Both of my parents were raised in orphanages. 
My mother was orphaned in, the, uh, in 1909 in Ottawa. Wow. She was five years old at the time. And she said the only thing she ever said about it was that her parents were killed with one bullet, is what she said. And they were they were found on the streets in Ottawa. She and her younger brother. She was put in the Ottoman orphan where my other grandmother was a cook. And that leads to a long story of how she got to America. Wow. And uh, my my father was not an orphan, but his father had died as a migrant worker in around in Philusia, where he died of pneumonia looking for work as a, a tinker or a cobbler, I don't remember which. And he was taken back to Hajin, where he was raised by American missionaries and eventually became a Protestant. And my grand uncle, uh, Melidon Effendi Malian, who was a Protestant minister, was traveling with a group of 40 uh, church members and, uh, down to Ottawa to a convention where he was going to receive ordination. And they were all massacred on the road at Sauk, catch it if I pronounce yes. it correctly. Osmania. Yeah. And I found in the UCLA library when I was doing my dissertation research, a, um, an article in Armeno Turkish um, of an eyewitness account of the, of the uh, massacre of the church representatives. My father translated it, mm -hmm. and I published that in my father's memoirs. Excellent, excellent. I do mention the Saga cheat uh, massacres in the book, but regarding bullet, I have an imp important information because one of the doctors who comes to treat the injured, he says that uh, here's the most of the injured people or people who were killed were, were killed by bullets. So showing the extremity of you know this is the this is the time of buying selling bullets after, uh, weapons after 1908. And followed by blunt instruments, and but bullet played an important role in the massacres. So we have Daniel, and then uh, the lady. We received a question online that builds right off of um, the story that was just told. Uh, Professor, could you tell us more about the massacre of the Protestant ministers? Excuse me, an audience member would like to know. She also had an ancestor who died there. Yeah, the, definitely. I mean, there was a there was an annual gathering of the Protestants in Adana, which was uh, going to take place in Adana, and you have uh, twenty to thirty people coming from different parts of the of the region in order to gather in Adana. And uh, during the massacres, they uh, they hide in the church in Sagecit in Osmaniye uh, district. And they're burned alive, I think, in the in the church. So, I mean, there's multiple records of this in the uh, missionary archives in the American Board of Commission missionary archives. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, you said the revolution happened in 1908, and in 1909 there was a counter revolution. What was the counter revolution? Now, the counter revolution uh, basically was. Uh, a revolution that took place in the capital by uh, a mix of uh, of interest groups that included people of the ancien regime, dissatisfied army uh, army officials, and third are the religious students who saw that the revolution, that the constitution, is an abrogation of the Islamic Sharia. What was the first group? The uh, the uh, ancien regime people, ancien regime means the re regime that belonged to the Abdul Hamid. Oh. Yeah. So I mean, in the past, they would describe the counter revolution as an Islamic manifestation of you know, but that's not the case actually. That was the question, and then we'll go back to him. Um, thank you very much. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, I bought the book when it came out. I haven't had time to read it yet. 
but I look forward to doing so. And I especially appreciated your uh, explanation of how the various factors came together to, you know, produce this complex series of events. And that's the I have a kind of methodological question you're introducing. You're introducing the ideas of rumor and emotion. And rumor, it's a little bit easier to understand how you could pull rumor from archival materials. Forever. But my question is um, from the point of method, how did you introduce them and how did you evaluate the idea of emotion? Uh, based on reports and actions. I mean, this is not the period where you can go and interview everyone, but from the uh, from the actions of the perpetrators, looting from the reports as to what they were doing and from the eyewitness accounts of the victims themselves. You know, we don't have we don't have a book, even for Darmin Jonathan, we don't have a book like Gene Hatsfield's book, which is the Machete season. And if anyone has read that, it was with Wandon genocide where he interviews perpetrators. They tell him, this is what I did. This is why I killed, <laughs> you know, we don't have that. So it's a, it's a difficult analysis, but emotions, human emotions are natural emotions, I think. Fear, greediness, uh, anger, us versus them specifically becomes heightened during times of crisis. Right, there's, you know, and in historiography, there's like such a gap between history as told from above and the yeah. yeah, 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 of course, of course. I mean, here's the thing, I mean, you would say, I mean, people tend to be obsessed with where is the document, where is the order document, you know, some people carry a document saying, I found the document uh, that, uh, you know, shows the Armenian genocide. Well, I see, I say, I, we don't need a document that proves that there was an Armenian genocide. Perpetrators do not keep records, except maybe in the case of the Nazis. The Nazis were 100% sure that they're going to win the war. Perpetrators do not keep records. We, as genocide scholars or massacre scholars, analyze the actions, the consistency of the event itself, because massacre is not an aberration it's a logical event, logical action that takes place in a short period of time. The aim is not to exterminate, unlike genocide, in whole or in part. The aim is to discipline the population and prevent them from raising their head on other uh, intentions. Arnon, <laughs> You mentioned about the play written by Pedro Sturian. Yeah, yeah. Is this the same Pedro Sturian who died at the age of 21? That he has a play? Also? Yeah. Okay. Sev Horero, or something like that. It is in collection of. You see, this is this is interesting part of research. You find it, and then after a few years, you find who wrote it, and then after many after years, you find that it's an is a it's a softened version of the of the actual event. So actual play. I know. My grandparents were also from Adana, and uh, I've heard that one of, the, one of the most horrific memories are from those Bashi. Bashi Bozuks, yeah. I want to ask you if you could tell us more about them. Were they independent groups? Were they, how were they organized? Who were these? Uh, Basha Bozuks are irregular soldiers, supposedly. They're, uh, they're, they're equivalent to gangs. Uh, and as a matter of fact, during the massacres, they put White, uh, 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 white, uh, white scars on their head in order to distinguish distinguish themselves from others, and so I, I, I say that a mob perpetrated the violence. The mob included the Bashabozuks, who came from uh, different parts of the uh, uh, periphery. Let's say the refugees, Cretan refugees, and others who were there. Because the long term, if you remember, one of the long term, uh, long term uh, causes was influx of refugees and then creating conflict of uh, competition over resources. The migrant workers, many Armenian migrant workers were killed, and we don't know where where are they. Who came from different parts of the provinces? They came to work and they they were killed. So again, so it's a it's 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 an important. Arno, I just also would like to take this uh, opportunity to thank you for bringing 
books dealing with Adana, including my books there, if everyone is interested. But also, uh, those of you who don't know Arno, Arno is the, is the most important person in terms of promoting the Armenian, Armenian culture history through his excellent bookstore, Abril. And it was featured today in the Daily News. Uh, so please follow the article. Thank you, Arno, for everything you do for, for yeah. us. Uh, another question received online. I'm going to paraphrase it a bit. Uh, you mentioned that there were Armenians who were uh, tortured and forced uh, to admit that they were planning to take over Adana. Uh, the question says, did similar things happen during the genocide? And if so, were those are those records used in modern Turkey to deny the genocide? Uh, yes. Actually, during the Armenian genocide, uh, uh, so here's the thing. Propaganda plays an important role in, during the Armenian genocide. So basically, the first thing they do is go to the houses to try to bring weapons in order to prove that there's an Armenian uprising. This is during the genocide. So they bring, they see that there is there's only 20 guns. This is not good for public appearance because there's an important book that's published called The Aims of the Armenian Revolutionary Groups. It's published in English, French, and Ottoman. This is the most important book of the uh, Young Turk propaganda during World War I. They published in World War I. So what do they do? They go to the police station and bring another 300 guns and put it in front of these 220 guns with bombs, etc., and take a picture that they have confiscated this from the Armenians. And torture plays an important role too during the Armenian genocide. I mean, here is the thing. All of you know the knock on the door and my father left and never we never saw him again we never saw him again he was taken tortured and killed and uh, false statements and you know so but to that extent yeah and during the Adana massacres false statements because it's interesting they want to work with these perpetrators or whoever they want to work with legal norms but they want to extract uh, 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 witness you know statements by force one of the most important figures is Garabe Chalian actually who was a Hunchak, Hunchak member, I think, Chalian, I'm not mistaken. He goes to uh, he goes to uh, he goes to Cairo actually and publishes uh, a book in Ottomans uh, titled "How Is Justice? How Justice Was Achieved in Adana." He even says during the my my uh, imprisonment, they tortured me and put an iron thing on my head, and I had to say that Musha was planning an uprising, and Musha wasn't there actually. During the massacre, prior to the massacre, two months prior to the massacre, Musha went to Cairo or Alexandria in order to raise money from the AGBU to establish a, 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 a high school in Adana. That's very important. He wasn't there. He tries to come back. They refuse to let him into Adana, so he returns back. There's his... Uh, important memoir and uh, he has this small notebook that he carried with him uh, when he came went back and took notes on his journey after the <clears throat> genocide going back to be with his flock um yes what's your name no, my cousin actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned briefly that the Aleppo Bilai also yes. Uh, would you please uh, summarize what distance those uh, after effects covered? And did the provincial government have any records or communities? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are certain areas in Aleppo that uh, on the border with Ottawa that the massacres, because massacres are waves, you know, waves based on rumors, because for example, in Tarsus, which is which had the most important St. Paul College, uh, it's Tarsus. Mm -hmm. uh, rumors go to Tarsus that Armenians have killed all the Muslims and they're coming here. So immediately now you have a uh, beginning of massacres in Tarsus too, and other places too. You know, the worst massacres took place in Bahce, in the in the subdistrict of Jabal Barakat. And here you have the sub-governor there sending erratic messages around that Armenians are number 10,000 on the horses are uh, marching to Adana. It's all, all fake. 
And who's that Armenian marching? Is Garabek Gökterelian and that I showed you his image. He was a lawyer. Apparently, he was he was on the on the on with five thousand or ten thousand Armenians marching. It's going to they're going to establish the independent Cilicia. But it was the prophecy that they believed in. But humanitarian intervention did not take place. So what kind, what type of prophecy? Yeah. Because these prophecy will continue eventually, even during the Armenian genocide. That Armenians are yeah. I have a I have a question since nobody wants to ask. Um, so um, the question of the continuity thesis or the continuum uh, thesis uh, in terms of that sees um, the Armenian genocide is extendable um, backwards uh, to other from uh, 1915 to uh, the uh, massacres of the 1890s to Adana and so on. So I'm wondering your book kind of your, your book deals with this, but I'm wondering if you could. Discuss this matter of continuity, yeah. this continuity yeah. um, uh, for us in general. Yeah, um, very, very good question. That really, very good question. Uh, there are multiple interpretations. Some uh, argue that the uh, the genocide began in the uh, Hamidian period and ended with the uh, Young Turk period. Others argue, for example, like late Dodrian, that the Adana massacre was dress rehearsal for the Armenian genocide. I don't think that these are inter related events, that these are different events, but they have certain commonalities. Not in the sense that it was the aim from the beginning to get rid of all the Armenians, because similar events of massacres took place not only in Adana, but in 1861 in, 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 in Lebanon and many other regions. So these are just manifestations towards the second half of the 19th century that deals with modernity, um, ethno-religious violence, nationalisms, etc. So it's not that from the beginning it was the aim of the Turks to get rid of the Armenians. That's the scholarly stance that I have, regardless of what everyone, I respect your points of view, but that's the scholarly stance that I have. But there are commonalities. And the, first, the biggest commonality is impunity. Impunity. Or three commonalities. Impunity, Lack of just lack of uh, uh, impunity means when you perpetrate a crime and you escape from that impunity. Uh, lack of humanitarian intervention, second, and third, international apathy, because even during the other massacres, for example, everyone knew about it, even from Omaha, Nebraska to Lincoln to any place you want. He knew about the massacres in the front pages. But the governments did not do anything. Their own governments did not do anything. That's apathy. Even during the, for example, even during the, I'm writing on this article now uh, with the Lachin Corridor and trying to connect <laughs> these themes together, that even during, even Henry Morgenthau was the ambassador of the of United States to the Ottoman Empire, gets reports from the provinces, from the American consul saying, you know, they're massacring Armenians. He writes back to the, uh, to, the, to the US government saying, look, this is out of control, we should do something. And the government says, we don't have to interfere, this is beyond our responsibility or something of that sort. So I think of it that the United States with all its uh, Wilsonian dreams and et cetera, and in the end it hushes down the Armenian genocide for economic reasons, because Turkey becomes an economic, Important economic <laughs> asset for the United States during Ataturk's period and I want to today. Um, yeah, so another uh, question received online. Oh, we know that in the aftermath of the genocide, I'm paraphrasing, in the aftermath of the genocide, there is a redistribution of uh, human beings and material assets. Was there a similar thing after uh, the other massacres? Beings and distribution of human beings. Sorry, I over up your face. No, um, in the aftermath of the genocide, uh, women and children were put into Muslim families, and Muslims oh, yes, ended yes, up yes, with yes. Armenian material wealth too. Yes, of course, of course. Now you have the if I mean if you have destruction of homes, families, they were taken by refugees to houses. Uh, there were a lot of cases of Islamization, forced. Uh, abduction of Armenian girls, uh, cases of rape, and there was also forced conversion to Islam. So there is a major problem. This is one of the sub-problems that the Armenian patriarchate has to deal with, trying to return back 
the Armenians who were Armenian women who were abducted back to Islam. It was a major blow to the Armenian economic for power in Adana because the economic power was rising in Adana. Armenians were really had really important position, economic position other than that was a major blow to the uh, Adana Armenian economic infrastructure. So the burning factories, burning their own implements, everything, you know, that's a major crisis, economic crisis. But again, think of the way in which global transformations affect Adana too. This is not only an Adana case, it's uh, the economic cotton, Etc. These are just you know underlying tensions that exist. There seems to be also a commonality between uh, certain massacres uh, that were perpetrated here, of course, at the same time, around the same time as the Adana massacres, for instance, uh, the Tulsa. Tulsa, yeah, yeah. I was That's watching a documentary point. recently. Nineteen twenty-one. Yeah. So within the same. Roughly Sand Creek was 1860. But rumors also play a very important Of course. Role. That's why there are a lot of commonalities between human beings, the way you don't have to be Muslim, Christian, Chinese, or so you don't have to be any religion. We are all human beings and we have the potential, given the stresses, to do things that you even imagine. I'm not saying human beings are evil, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Um... Oh, yeah. I'm always forgetting the first one there. Um, so after uh, the Adana massacres, what was the sort of reverberating effect among like armed political parties? Was there a wave of mobilization or armament saying that like this happened in Adana, it's going to happen in Boston or Zayton or wherever? So again, there is the point of view that CUP was behind Adana. All right. And what's the proof? The proof is that that letter that was sent, telegram sent by the under secretary saying kill the Armenia, don't kill, make sure to, to protect the foreigners. Now, after the Adana massacres, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation in August signs a cooperation agreement with the Young Turks. I don't think that the Central Committee was involved in the Adana massacres, Young Turks, what I do, I know that the local Young Turks were involved one way or another. Otherwise, why would the Young Turks, why would the ARF Sign an <laughs> agreement of cooperation with uh, with with the Young Turks. They had two main objectives. First, security, security for the Armenians, and the second thing, returning back the land, the land question, which were confiscated during the Hamidun period. And when both of these failed to achieve anything, in 1911, the uh, Armenian Revolution Federation detaches its connections, uh, cuts its, its relationship with the Young Turks. But the Hunchaks, for example, from the beginning were never, never wanted to have anything with the Young Turks. They believed that the intentions of the Young Turks were not positive towards the Armenians. Even prior to the Young Turk Revolution, they said, we're never, we're never going to uh, discuss, that we're not going to do anything. Actually, a new edited volume is coming up. Uh, about the Hunchucks, um, I, I've edited in November, which are many articles in there that we, we discuss these intricate questions, actually. So they, they Hunchucks did cooperate, actually, with the Ottoman opposition. Thank right? you, Anthony. Yeah. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes, Hos, uh, Sebu. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, Alex. Thank you, Professor, for your talk today. Um, I was wondering if you could perhaps speak a little to what the Armenian response was during the Inter massacre period. If I recall correctly, you mentioned that the first wave of violence ended when yeah. the Armenians gave up their arms and agreed to yeah. some sort of peace. Was the understanding that there would be somewhat lasting peace? Uh, yes. Was the expectation that, yes. was, that it, was, was there any understanding that perhaps violence would reoccur? No. Because think of it, I mean, Three days of massacres, April 14, 15, 16. And then afterward, but the massacres continue in other districts. So it's not doesn't mean that the massacre ended. Massacres continue in other districts. But after the first wave of massacres, Armenians are regathering themselves. Actually, uh, they meet with the uh, with the with the notables, the Turkish notables. 
And there's a whole scenario there of things that are happening. They're reluctant to sign any treaty. They're reluctant to come to any any uh, agreement with them. And there is the Americans, American, uh, American, uh, the sorry, the British vice consul uh, 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 part of, participates, and you know he forces to a certain extent Armenians to agree to the to put down their weapons, and you know that th this has ended. And then the, the 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 news that additional battalions are coming gives some hope to the Armenians that this has ended. But then the other question is that why did the second wave of massacre took place? And I provide different interpretations in the book, you know, because the Armenians firing from the Armenian quarter on the Muslim on the on the camp of the soldiers that not does not hold ground. Because investigation commission, when it comes, it sees that there is a hill between the Armenian quarter and the camp. So it's, I mean, unless it's a bullet, it's, there are no bullets, you know, that it's worth, unless the bullet goes up and down, there is no other explanation. It seems that they came by preconceived notions. They were instigated by the locals in order to, uh, in order to create more chaos and continue the job. Yep. 20,000 plus, but what was the overall population of Armenians in the, in the Adana region? Adana region should be about uh, 60 to 70,000. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have coffee and coffee is in the back. Please mingle as much as you want. And, uh, uh, the books are in the back as well.